you have found Magpie Stories, a channel dedicated to original narrations from the author with weekly uploads. I hope you have a pleasant time listening. Magpie Stories presents In Utmost Happiness The thing about death is You never quite know what face it is going to take He noticed a fetid smell in the air The smell of something partially digested wafting around his nose the order of events was confused. First, there was the smell, followed by the brain, recognising a sound that was not dissimilar from that of the last drop of air being gently forced out of a balloon. His gaze snapped to the back half of the mutt. It didn't even turn around, but he knew it was pleased with itself. He knew this, because as soon as he looked at it, the tail began to slowly and rhythmically hit the ground. You bloody the phone burred into life cutting short the swearing eyes scanned the room trying to locate the noise there it was halfway between the cushions of the sofa well that's where it always seemed to be what oh the rancid smell again the little pfft of noise the gentle thumping of a tail and the single thought bastard hi Chris, uh, Steve. A voice blurted out. It sounded slurred. He immediately felt different to how he did before. Jesus, Steve, it's only gone eight. No, oh, no, I, I, it's not what you. The sound of broken glass in the background and muffled swearing. Uh, I'll call you back. A click, and the line went dead. So that was the order of play then. A simple day gone to hell already. It was no life for someone of Chris's stature. How the bloody hell was he going to get out of this one? The simple answer was, he was not. Straight out of the house then, leaving behind the very important task of doing sod all. Sod and all were great when you could get them. And he hadn't, not for a long time. Chris shrugged on his black coat. This was truly black, not the imitations that you got at even the best places like Marks and Spencers. This coat took in all aspects of the electromagnetic spectrum and refused to let them go. It was almost as if someone had hemmed in a black hole into the fabric. Almost. As Chris walked to the car, even radio channels seemed to become absorbed by the coat. Nearby traffic was puzzled, as though they were stuck in a tunnel, men and women desperately fiddling with dials and switches, anything to avoid talking to their passengers. Things didn't get easier as the time passed. The journey was always the most exciting part, apparently, and the irony of this wasn't lost on Chris. He often mused. If it was so bloody good, then why would taxi drivers such miserable bastards? He passed a clapdown van on the road. It was ten years old and covered in rusted scabs of metal. There were a couple of things he noticed. The first was the hand illuminated sign, Dad's Taxi. He hoped the apostrophe was in the wrong place, or there was a collection of fathers who were A. Very cross and B lacked an imaginative thought between them. The second thing he noticed was a youth of some description wearing a peaked hat that announced something vaguely political. He was not paying that much attention. There was an odd smell of the sound of a tail thumping. How had the bloody dog managed to get into the bloody car? It had started to rain. So much for the journey destination, mind you, wasn't going to be any better. 
When Chris stared out of the windows, he realised that everything started to bleed into one another. The only thing that seemed out of place was the coat. He could only see the sleeves in his line of vision, but it was a stark contrast from his grey wrists on the grey steering wheel looking at the grey road. This always seemed to be happening. No colour and no joy, it was all take and harvested before he could reach it. Seemingly a million miles away, the phone rang bleeping in the distance. Sod it, it could wait. There would be enough time for that, but first he had to see to Steve. On the plus side, there had been no tail thumping for at least five minutes. Chris smiled softly, something that happened increasingly rarely, and decided to put on the radio. Two things brought reality into sharp relief. The first was that only one station that he could pick up was clearly designed for moronic teens. Ironically, these were the ones who were edgy and unique, along with all of their friends who were the same as them in their uniqueness. And the second, well, needless to say, it ended with a tail, gently thumping. Windscreen wipers tore across the glass, Chris winced behind his tinted spectacles, there was red illuminating the lenses, traffic moved and stopped, a rhythmic beating heart. There was always a pattern to the chaos, everything had a span, a turn, a purpose, even if that was to affect only itself. Chris was moving at a lick now, something spattered against the windscreen harder than the rain, but ultimately too soft for the glass, a fly had served its turn. Chris shut his eyes briefly. Uh, it always seemed to be there. Sadly, the hangover was kicking in, the redness had grown more vivid, tinting the lenses further. The traffic had stopped. Again. The phone rang briefly. Chris had set it to voicemail. His voice chimed in automatically. I leave a message. His voice sounded very insincere. There was a small hesitation. Juan, Juan, I, I just wanted to say... The voice started to ramble incoherently. It would be saved. The wipers turned and Chris concentrated on driving. A little roughs from somewhere behind him. Oh, shut up, you git. There was mock anger in his voice. Don't make me feed you that dry food crap you hate. No more roughs. Just an understanding between dog and master with the familiar pfft. Mm, sodding dog, Chris thought. He knew that the animal would now have its face pressed against the window, and would be leaving a snot trail across the glass. Brilliant, he thought. Well, at least it had taken his mind off Steve and seeing that stupid fly hit his window. Wrong place, and wrong time. A cigarette had appeared at the corner of his mouth. He lit it. Immediately, Chris forgot where his lighter was. That was really odd. It was as if he had thought it, and then reality shaped around his whim. The ash seemed to think about landing on the coat, and then decided against it. The flare of burning tobacco added a sinister haze to the glasses. It made him look as if his pupils were on fire. Chris gripped the steering wheel tightly. The fingers had gone from ashen grey to an almost bleached bone. The house was near. He could see it in the far distance. In no time at all, Chris pulled up, the wheels crunching on gravel, like the shells of delicate insects under a careless child's flip-flop. He was inside. Steve would be somewhere. Chris had left the dog in the car, whining gently and rhythmically. Right, Steve, come on, it's time. Chris bellowed. A pause. And a petulant voice retorted, Not yet. A pleading sound followed by, Please, just a little more time. The voice was slurry. Chris couldn't remember how long it had taken him to get over here, but this had to be done. Right, I have a hangover and no patience. Come on, let's get this done. There was a tone of finality. Steve looked deflated. He looked awful, like all the blood had drained out of him. Chris removed his glasses, massaged his eyelids, and slid the frames back over his ears. Steve thought it odd that he could wear glasses like that on a day like today. You called, and I had to come. Chris took Steve's hand and began to pull. His coat looked very black. It was absorbing colour, vitality, life. Steve was being mad. 
Chris blinked and suddenly they were in the car. Don't worry Steve, it's all about the journey. Where are we going? Steve mumbled, trembling. Not sure, sighed Chris. This was technically true. He didn't really know where Steve was going. It was strange, he thought, considering the circumstances. One of life's little mysteries. The dog had nuzzled its way into Steve's lap. He absently stroked her. She began to lick his hand. He was visibly calmer. He breathed slowly. What's his name? Sorry, Chris said. He had been lost in his thoughts. What's his name? Steve said distantly. Well, her name is Falcate, Chris said, slightly embarrassed. And that was the name she had from before. Before? quizzed Steve. From before I had her. When I got her from Darren, Chris couldn't remember. And that bothered him. I'd said Latin for something, I think. The car swerved across the lane almost as if it didn't see Chris and Steve. Jesus, I swear that I should have clipped us, Steve said, still calmly stroking the dog who was now licking any part of Steve's arms that came into reach. It's like they let every idiot out on the road today. You could kill someone driving like that. A mechanical response from Chris like he had said it a thousand times before to a thousand different people. The car carried along. It wasn't really bothered about other traffic. It had come close to many collisions in the past and it never seemed to get a ding or a dent. Time seemed to pass. So why ring me? Chris asked. What is so important that you ring me in that state? Uh, I think it was because you always used to help me out, Steve replied in a low monotone voice. Where am I going? That's not my choice, Chris abruptly said. You haven't really answered the question, why Chris, and why now? Speaking in the third person is, is a bit strange, Chris. Damn, I mean, why me? Chris internally chided himself. This was always happening. You used to be there. You were someone to rely on. I still don't understand how I got hold of you. How you came to be here is crazy. How? How can you be here? Panic edged Steve's words. You cannot be here. I don't understand. You're supposed to be. The car drew up alongside the road. Chris's hands gripped the steering wheel so tightly. That they were now pure white. His coat now danced with all the shades of black in colour so vivid it hurt to look at them. Chris said nothing, but his glasses seemed to glow a ruddy orange, presumably from the orange backlight from the control panels. A tear formed at the corner of one eye, reflecting the greyness around him. Time to get out. As if in agreement with this, the dog gave Steve one final affectionate lick, and gently eased herself back into the rear seats. A look of realisation dawned on Steve's face. So, all the time, it wasn't you. It wasn't you really, you were just a, a friendly face. In a way, yes and no, Chris said. I am what you needed me to be. The voice wasn't sad or happy, but it was efficacious. So what now? I don't know. Never do. There was a wistful lilt in his voice. Ah, I am all about the journey. The destination is out of my hands. He felt stupid saying it. Chris went to close the door. Well, wait, thanks, Chris. And with that, Steve turned and began to trudge towards the gate of a grey house. Small, dried rivulets of something red could be seen at his wrists. Almost on automatic pilot, the car knew what was happening. It respectively backed away and drove on home. He found himself back at his house. He shrugged off the black coat and decided it was time for a rest. The dog was facing away from him. He had just begun to close his eyes when 
A tinny beeping emerged from some cushions between the sofas. He glanced down and saw there was a voicemail locked inside the sleek plastic and the glass box. He bipped the buttons and pressed the speakerphone. Juan, Juan, I just wanted to say. And the voice started to ramble incoherently. I wish to thank you for listening to Magpie Story. You'll hear from me again soon.